and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them uh, what things should happen unto them, unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them unto him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. To give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Please be seated. And before we begin, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again for calling us to your courts this morning, for giving us the privilege of uh, coming together as a church in worship, uh, privilege of confessing our sins to you, Uh, receiving afresh an assurance of pardon that the once-for-all sacrifice of your Son is paid for our sins in full, Uh, that there is no no sin left unpaid for for your elect people. Um, And so we uh, thank you for this privilege of coming together now before your word, and we pray that you would, uh, with the sharp sword of your word, continue to uh, cut us to the heart uh, and mold us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray that you do this by your spirit this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we begin looking at our text, I think it's really important that we have another text as a backdrop in our heads. As we work through this, I'm going to read through the entirety of Isaiah chapter 53. There's debate. I'll go over it as we go through the text. There's debate as to whether this is what Jesus is referencing in our text, but I think it's plain as day and so important that we have this text Uh, in the back of our minds when we hear Jesus' words to the disciples uh, in Mark 10. So this is Isaiah chapter 53, one of the servant songs. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised. And rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and, we dis- and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. Was he stricken? And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because 
He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's Isaiah chapter 53. Though there's some debate again as to whether Jesus was referencing this text in Mark, or text in Mark this morning, I believe it is most necessary, uh, most certainly rather, what Jesus was alluding to in this teaching to his disciples. Right, he's teaching the disciples in this setting, and so this morning we come to the third instance. If you remember, this is the third instance in which Jesus is uh, declaring very plainly. This is the most plain we have it, but very plainly to the disciples of his need to suffer and die. And we've seen a consistent hardness of heart in the disciples every time Jesus has brought this up, right? Very clear teaching on what he's going to do and very clearly missing the point on the part of the disciples. We're going to see that again this morning. So the fact that this reality has already been made known to you twice in this gospel account, uh, it shouldn't cause you to uh, put off this part of the story as something you already understand. You should see rather an emphasis that God is giving you this in his word. Oh, this is the third time Jesus is emphasizing this. This is actually really important. This is kind of quintessential to understanding the nature of the kingdom of God, the nature of Christ's ministry, that he came to suffer and die. He was setting up a kingdom, but it was radically different than the kingdoms of the earth of the time, the kingdoms of certainly the Gentiles. We see Jesus referencing them in our text this morning, but also uh, the way that the Pharisees and the Herodians were, were governing. Right? They were governing like the Gentiles. They were not governing, governing like Jesus would in the kingdom of God. And so what Jesus came to do in his earthly ministry, we must understand as literally the central act of the history of the world. Right? Jesus' work was the central purpose of creation. And so his suffering, right, his suffering was not the great plan that God determined after man's sin and God is then scrambling to figure out what he should do with man who has sinned, oh, I'll send my son to be a savior. No, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So when Jesus comes on the scene, this is the, this is the climax, not just of history in light of the fall, but the purpose of creation. Part of the purpose of creation is that God would redeem a people for himself. And so we're seeing the culmination of this now. Right? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. And so this glorious foreordained plan was now enfleshed. And in our account this morning, was on a march to his own death in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is on his way to. He's on his way to Jerusalem. His disciples know that. That's why James and John are taking advantage of the opportunity and seeking to solidify their place on his right hand and on his left. Because Jesus is on his way to his coronation. They're not wrong about that. They're wrong about the nature of it. Jesus clearly identifies himself in this text as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And so the picture of the nature of Christ's kingdom is continuing to be filled out for us. We're continuing to understand what this looks like. Jesus is the son of man. We've made that point multiple times working through the gospel according to Mark. He's the son of man. But now we know that the, we see here the son of man is Jehovah's suffering servant of the servant songs of Isaiah. And so in light of this, we're receiving in our text a clear teaching on what Jesus is suffering his death, and his resurrection would accomplish. Because Isaiah 53 doesn't just tell us uh, what he's going to do, but it's going to tell us what it's going to produce. Right? What it's going to do, what it's going to produce, the fact that it's going to establish Jesus as our intercessor. Right? He's going to pay for our sins, cover our iniquities so that we might be washed in his righteousness, as we saw from, or as we heard from 2 Corinthians 5 in our scripture reading today. So this text serves to teach us more about the nature of the kingdom of God, reminding us, again, that foolish pride will do nothing in advancing the, purpose, advancing the purposes of this kingdom, and that humility must be at the heart of all of our endeavors. But one of the other unique things, so that's, a, that's certainly a, an overarching theme in our text, but one of the unique things we see in this particular instance of Jesus' teaching is his approach. We're given a little bit of insight into his demeanor, 
And we see this from the very first verse of our text, right? It says, and they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. So he's leading from the front, walking to Jerusalem. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Jesus is just walking here. But there's something about the way he's going about this that's making the disciples amazed and afraid. He's walking as their head. He's leading the group on this walk to Jerusalem. He's doing so in such a way, whatever was going on specifically, that the disciples are amazed and scared. And we're not given specifics, but it could have something to do with what Jesus had already said was going to happen to him. Right? Just because they have a hardness of heart to exactly how it's going to play out doesn't mean they don't recognize that Jesus has made pretty clear he's going to suffer and die, and yet he seems so determined, right? Leading from the front, uh, set on getting to Jerusalem. Right, Jesus was both clear on what would happen to him there and greatly determined to get there. And so the way in which Jesus was approaching this trip to Jerusalem was making the disciples uneasy. Jesus' steadfastness to get to Jerusalem was making the disciples uneasy. And as Jesus will go on to give a most explicit teaching on the nature of his ministry, this stalwart trek by Jesus becomes all the more glorious from our perspective, right, seeing what Jesus was going to accomplish, knowing the fruit that would be born from that. But for the disciples, as the glory builds for us and what we see, the, the fear for the disciples seems to build as well. Right, he's not going to Jerusalem. Jesus is not going to Jerusalem with any ambiguity as to what he must do and what he must suffer. There's no ambiguity on that, and yet we see him determined to get there. He's walking the road to his coronation as king, full well knowing that it will be full of indescribable pain, and doing so, though, with rooted purpose. The disciples were scared, but we see here again, and this has been a, a theme with the disciples as well, this fear isn't a fear of God that produces in them wisdom. Right? It's a fear of, I don't know what's going on here. I don't really know how to square these two things together. Jesus is talking about suffering and dying. If I knew that that was what awaited me, I'd be running the other direction. Jesus seems dead set on getting there. So that, that's what's driving their fear, and because of that, we're going to see that uh, wisdom doesn't mark the words of the disciples, but foolishness continues to mark their words at this point in the gospel account. Right, this lack, lack of proper fear is going to cause the sons of thunder, James and John, to respond to Jesus' teaching foolishly in verse 35. But first in verses 33 and 34, uh, Jesus teaches the disciples. He tells them that they're going to this holy city, Jerusalem, and that he, the Son of Man, shall be delivered unto the religious elites among the Jews, and he not only predicts this event, right, says that he's going to be delivered to the Jews, but all the events following that, all the way to his resurrection. Right, he lays out these events. And so we must see this as a, a prophecy from Jesus. Jesus is predicting what's going to happen, and we know that all these things come to pass. That's important to note. That's really important to note because so many people today, down to today, uh, even you know, conversations I was having with some family members who are not Christians uh, over this past week, you know, Oh, you know, I know Jesus. I know Jesus is really central to like whatever we're supposed to understand about the world and how things work. I know Jesus plays a really big part in that, right? And that's like this, in a from an atheistic perspective, that's this like pious, wise, philosophical thing to say. Oh yeah, Jesus had a lot of wise sayings. I was like, no, Jesus made very clear who he was, what he was seeking to accomplish, right? These are prophecies. So once he says these kind of things, as one who claims to speak for God, they either come to pass and he proves himself to be a true prophet, the greatest prophet, or they don't come to pass and he's a fraud. Right? So these things matter. When Jesus makes these claims, you can't divorce things like this that Jesus says from other quote-unquote wise sayings that you want to rip out of the Bible and, and apply to some more broad philosophical approach to the world. And so, so this text becomes very important. Any text where Jesus is predicting something well, we should see that come to pass. And that's exactly what we see in this very gospel account. Right? Chapters 14 through 16 of Mark's gospel would be the fulfilling of this string of prophecies. Right, Judas is going to deliver Jesus to the chief priests in chapter 14, verse 35. The religious elites are then going to sentence Jesus to death in verse 64 of chapter 14. Those elites deliver Jesus. Right, They could condemn him to death, but they couldn't kill him themselves. They had to deliver him to the Gentiles. And so they did exactly that, delivered him to Pontius Pilate in chapter 15, verse 1 whose servants went on to mock, to spitefully entreat, to spit upon and to scourge Jesus. Verse, chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. From there, Jesus would indeed, as he predicted, be put to death on, a, on the cross. Chapter 15, verses 20 through 39. 
and three days later he would rise from the dead. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. So Jesus is predicting his future sufferings. He's predicting his death, his resurrection, and he's predicting these things accurately. Jesus is a true prophet, and this fact, uh, and this is a fact which must be brought to bear whenever people want to question the nature of Jesus' ministry. He is a true prophet. What he said came to pass, and all of it. Jesus clearly states that he came to suffer and die, and he will only continue to make the purpose of uh, this, the purpose of this more clear in our text this morning as we work towards verse toward verse forty five. He predicts these events perfectly, vindicating himself as the true and greatest prophet. He is, in fact, the Word made flesh. Right? There's no more true word, no more sure word than the Word made flesh himself as he speaks to his people. The second thing to note from Jesus' words here, I think is highlighted more clearly in Luke's account. So again, this is the third instance of Jesus uh, bringing to bear the nature of his ministry explicitly to the disciples. And when he says this in Luke's account, this is Luke 18, verses 31 through 33. He took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, right, same as our text, and all things that are written by the prophets that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, he shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted upon, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. So what's that addition? Luke highlights for us that Jesus, as the great teacher, was perfectly clear on what the Old Testament taught. That's where Jesus is getting this information from. That's how he knows who the, he knows who the suffering servant is. He knows he is the suffering servant. And so he clearly lays out, this is not just a prophecy coming out of nowhere. Oh, I'm giving you a new word from God. This is what the Messiah would do. No, he's saying this is what the prophets from long ago predicted would happen. This has been the word that God's people have hoped in since it was written by Isaiah, right? This is, and, and many other prophets, that this would be the work of the Messiah. This was the path. It was always going to be a perfect sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice for the people of God. And so that's what Luke highlights for us. Jesus knew and taught others that the Old Testament pointed forward to him. And we see, as, as examples, we see between Isaiah 53 that we read this morning and then our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 50, and then looking at Psalm 20, 22, we have all these matters abundantly covered. We could, we could, of course, look elsewhere, but Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him. And verses 8 and 9 from Isaiah 53. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare His generation? For He was cut off out of the land of the living. Right? He was killed. For the transgression of my people was He stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. And so all of this suffering up to and including death was prophesied long before Christ came in the flesh. But both Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 also tell us that this suffering servant would have life again after death. Even this resurrection was predicted. That the suffering servant of Isaiah's prophecy, it says in verse 11, of chapter 53 would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. On the other side of death, he would see the travail of his soul, see what he went through, see the fruit of what was born from what he went through and be satisfied. And his prayer, Christ's prayer in Psalm 22 and his dying breath would be answered. Right, The first half of Psalm 22, you have this, this prayer of Christ that uh, tradition at least teaches us that was recited by Jesus on the cross. But certainly it's a prophecy looking forward to that day. And that prayer and his dying breath would be answered. And we see the answer to that prayer in Psalm 22 as well. This is verses 22 through 31. It's worth reading at length. It says, I will declare thy name. But after that prayer is answered, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him all ye seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him all ye, all the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live 
forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee for the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. So Jesus knew what lay before him in Jerusalem because he knew his Bible. Right, this is what the prophets of old spoke. These are words that the disciples had access to. They should have known these truths. Jesus knew his Bible, and so he knew what lay before him in Jerusalem. And that concept is extremely important for us to grasp and to apply to our own lives. Right? If you know your Bible, right, people are all about knowing the, certainly this is like a big thing in college, right? knowing the will of the Lord for your life. And you can go to a lot of explicit Bible texts that tell you exactly what the will of the Lord is for your life. Right? Keep yourself from idols. Right? Walk after him. Obey his commandments. This is the will of the Lord, your sanctification. But if you know your Bible, you will always be oriented correctly, whatever season you're in. Even if you're not completely clear on the specifics, if you know your Bible, you know that story, and you're entrenched in that story. Because you know the Bible is not the kind of thing we can uh, check a box on understanding and knowing and then move on to some kind of deeper spirituality. That's not how the Bible functions at all in our lives. It can't as Christians. Right? The Bible is living and active. And so as we read the Bible, we're formed into the image of Christ. Right? God does that work as we read his word, as we commune with him. And so the Bible can't be this kind of thing that we, yeah, that we check a box of and then move on to, you know, now we're going to go read some theology books. Right? The Bible has to be our bread and butter day in, day out. I love reading as much as the next guy, but if the Bible is not your bread and butter day in and day out, then you're going you're gonna to forget this story and some of the specifics of it. You're not going to be uh, renewed in the word, and that's going to that's gonna eat away. And eventually you're going to find that you're not oriented the way you need to be in your life. Decisions you have to make. You're not going to be making them in light of the word of God because you don't know the word of God like you ought to. And so again, you don't need to know every little detail of every circumstance to know what you ought to do. You just need to know your Bible. And this is the case because if you know your Bible, if you keep yourself continually in that Bible, then you will know and be constantly reminded of the story God is telling and where history is heading. And we need that constant reminder. Very easy to get discouraged in today's day. Very easy. When we fail to continuously read our Bibles, we will inevitably fall into one worldly trap or another. One false narrative or another about what's happening in the world and what the solutions to those problems actually are. Right? Plenty of people have other answers to that. We need to be those who know and believe our Bibles. We are sinners. We have to own that, understand that we love to go astray. And so we must humbly seek God in his word and in prayer. Those who walk with God will be correctly oriented in whatever season they find themselves in. And that's the people we want to be. Now, before moving on to the response of the disciples, right? the, uh, the disciples, again, uh, not a commendable response that we see from them here. Um, after this glorious teaching from the Lord, right? Uh, referencing all these rich Old Testament texts that we should read and glory in, right? Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, the, Isaiah 50, these servant songs. You read those texts and it's, I mean, it just conjures up and you just, it's just glorious. It's pointing forward to the work of Christ. The fact that, you know, God prophesied this uh, through his servants so long ago. That's just a glorious picture. And, and so it's, uh, to see the disciples' response in light of that is even more just discouraging in terms of where they're at. But we should note before looking at that um, the cre and credit these disciples in the fact that they're following Jesus here. They are amazed and scared. Whatever exactly it was, I think it had a lot to do with the way in which Jesus was making this march to Jerusalem. They're amazed and they're scared, but where are they? Well, they're following Jesus. That's kind of important. Right? Because Jesus has said things, you know, look at John 6, for example, right? Jesus had said things to those who were following him, many turned away. Right? They were amazed and scared, and what did they do? They left. Well, not the disciples. Yeah, they're going to say some foolish things. But here they are following Jesus, amazed, scared, following Jesus. 
So the application for us is plain. Following Jesus may be frightening at times. Actually frightening. A few of us providentially have had this conversation recently about children, right? Thinking about the difficulties, the challenges of being open to having as many children as God would be pleased to bless us with. It's an interesting place to put yourself. It's really a place of faith to walk in a place like that. Oh, I don't know how this is going to line up financially. I don't know if I'm ready for that as a parent, right? There's, there's difficult things in that. And there's a trust that God's going to be faithful to provide for you. There's trust that God's going to be faithful to sanctify you, to take on that work well, and for those children to be a blessing. But what a perfect example of an opportunity to follow Jesus when you don't understand necessarily understand exactly how it's going to work out from your current vantage point. Maybe something else seems frightening to you. Maybe there is something in your life that you know Christ has called you to pursue, but you're scared of the commitments, worried about unforeseen struggles that you can't predict, unwilling to walk by faith. If Jesus has commanded it, then you must have faith and do it. If Jesus is heading somewhere, you should be going with him. If you see Jesus going somewhere, you should be going with him. The disciples are doing so. And that is objectively a good thing. Credit where credit's due. But verse 35 again begins a discouraging discourse in which the disciples show that they are completely missing everything Jesus is saying in these last couple chapters. James and John try to lock Jesus into a blessing, you see, in verse 35. They don't give him the details of it. They say, hey, we would love if you would give us what we ask. Right? And you see the difference between a wise man in Christ and a foolish man if you think back to Herod. Right? Herod puts himself in this horrible position because Salome dances for him, right? The daughter of Herodias. And he says, I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And Herod's heart sinks. But he's already, and he, what does it say? Well, it says, for his oath's sake, he went forward with it, right? So he put himself in a position to look like a fool. What does Jesus do in our text? He says, blessing, well, what do you want? Before I commit to this blessing, before I commit to this thing, what do you want? What are you asking? Well, since, you know, James and John know what they're doing. And so they, uh, though hesitant on the front end, finally send it in verse 37. They believe that this march to Jerusalem will involve Jesus ascending to the throne one way or another. They're right about the throne, but without understanding uh, what lay between the throne and that path to the throne. And at this point in their hearts, they want nothing to do with that. Uh, but they don't know this. James and John are picturing earthly power and authority asserted over everyone without any suffering, even though Jesus is predicting it plainly. And what they want to secure for themselves is the two and three spots in the kingdom. Allow us to sit on your right and your left hand. Right, and think about, you know, we haven't even exited this, this series of texts in Mark where the emphasis has been on what status in the kingdom even looks like. Right, so it's not just Jesus predicting his own, his own suffering, but even talking about just the nature of the kingdom, right? The first shall be last, the last first. Jesus, on multiple occasions, has brought children to him. Said, you know, such, for such is the kingdom of God. So that's been the dynamic, right? Never mind these children Jesus has been holding and blessing. Never mind the lessons about who shall enter into the kingdom of God. Right? Not the rich, but those who, uh, those who are like unto children. Never mind the explicit teachings about the last being first and the first last. That was all very confusing for the disciples and so far had done nothing, we see, to drive out of their hearts a prideful, vain glory that sought out their own good before the good of others. That's what James and John are, to, are doing here. Now before addressing the heart behind this question, and Jesus is going to get to the heart behind this question from James and John, he first deals with the ignorance of their question in verse 38. He says unto them, uh, but Jesus said unto them, ye know not what ye ask, can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Now, the Bible speaks of uh, cups, right? Jesus just says a cup. He doesn't give us specifics on that. We see the cup of blessing throughout the Bible, and then we see a cup of cursing. Right? But I think the, the context here, very clearly, we're talking about Jesus' suffering, right? It's, it's bookended by that. Right? Jesus starts the text by talking about what he must do, what's going to happen to him as they get to Jerusalem. He must... Uh, be handed over to the religious elite, be handed over to the Gentiles, uh, suffer, be crucified, die, and rise again. Right At the end of our text, Jesus came not to uh, serve, but to be served, to give his life. So that's the context we're in. So when you see cup, a cup that Jesus must drink in this context, 
I think very clearly we're talking about not a cup of blessing, but the cup of judgment. He's speaking of the cup of judgment which he would drink. We see that cup in Psalm 75 verse 8. It's a cup full of the wrath of God in Jeremiah 25 verses 15 through 29. The cup awaiting Jesus is related to the suffering that he will soon endure. It will be a cup full of the wrath of God for elect sinners. But we'll look at this more shortly. He also mentions baptism here. The baptism Jesus speaks of is clearly a reference to the same event. Right? He's elaborating on what, the disciples, on what the disciples don't understand that he's going to endure. They're saying, oh, we want to be with you in your kingdom. And Jesus is asking, do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to suffer alongside me, to establish this kingdom alongside me? Because it will involve great suffering. And so therefore we should understand this in the same terms of which, in which Paul speaks in Romans 6. When we think about the baptism that Jesus is speaking of here. right? Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 where Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from, up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So James and John want to share <clears throat> in Christ's glory. Right? They see Christ as the one who will be king. They're getting that right. He would be king. But their understanding of kingship is still shaped far more by the Herodians and the Pharisees than it is by the teaching of Christ. And so Jesus is seeking to teach them that they do not know exactly what they are asking. Right? They don't know what they're asking. Jesus' path to glory would involve drinking a most bitter, painful cup. His path to his throne would involve a baptism that involved a submersion into the waters of judgment, into the waters of death. Jesus knew exactly what lay ahead of him, and it was dark and ominous. The disciples, on the other hand, are in the dark. They don't understand. And as those who could not see or understand these words that Jesus spoke to them... They give a very resolute response. Jesus asked this question, can you, you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? We can. We thought about it. We can. Right now, in their present state, in their present state, and by what we have see, we'll see from the disciples as they flee from Christ, so we're going to, it's not going to get better right around the corner. They're going to flee from Christ in his hour of need. In their present state, they're speaking out of their own ignorance. They do not know what they're saying, and they're wrong about it. No, they can't. Where they're at now, they can't. They did not know what Jesus was talking about, and so they do not realize what they are committing to. In their present state, they're not ready to suffer after Christ. Right, the next two on Jesus' right and left, as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem, would be on crosses. They don't want those spots. That's not what they're thinking about. Because right, he was first not going to be raised to some earthly throne. He was going to be raised on a cross. And those crosses were surely, again, not what James and John had in mind. But surprisingly, what's Jesus' response to them? Well, Jesus says eventually they indeed would do just that. You will drink the cup that I'm drinking of. You will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. A day would come where these apostles would in fact see clearly what Jesus had done and taught. And it would cause them, out of great gratitude to follow after Christ with a similar resoluteness as we see with Christ on his march to Jerusalem. We see James' James' end in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, as he was killed at the end of another Herod, King Herod's sword. We know that John was exiled to Patmos. We don't know the end of his life, but surely he suffered greatly. After this surprising affirmation by our Lord, Jesus tells the disciples, that the arrangements around his throne would be given to those for whom it was prepared and that it was prepared by someone else. You're asking the wrong guy. right? Prepared by the Father. In verse 41, we see that the rest, of, the rest of the disciples are upset with James and John for asking this question to Jesus. And so we should ask, well, what's, what's behind that frustration by the disciples? right? Is it clicking? Is the nature of Jesus' ministry just clicking perfectly for the rest of the disciples and so they're frustrated at James and John just missing it? Is that the dynamic? Or are they in the same boat? I do not believe this was a righteous indignation on the part of the other ten disciples. Jesus in verse 42 is going to give his his teaching not only to James and John, but to all of the disciples. But he's going to sit them all down and tell them this thing because they all need to hear it. So they're not coming from this place of seeing 
uh, pride and vainglory in James and John and being upset that they're not, it's not clicking for them and that they would bring that before the Lord um, from a place of righteousness. Right? This displeasure from, from the other disciples is more about James and John being mad that James and John are the first to get to ask the question. Right? The sons of thunder just beat them to the punch. And so they're upset. So I don't think it's because they're without vainglory, but because uh, their own vainglory is being frustrated in the dynamic. And what this teaches us, what we must keep in, in mind uh, when we think about our anger toward others and their sin, hatred for someone's sin does not make you righteous. The righteous hate sin, but hating sin doesn't necessarily make you righteous because there's many motivations from which you could be hating that sin. Right? One prideful man can be angered by the pride of another prideful man, but he's really just mad because that prideful man, in his pride, bested him. It's not mad because God is offended by that sin. And that's where righteous anger is rooted. Right? You may be angry at the laziness of someone else, but are you angry because they're offending God or because they're keeping you from being lazy? It's really hard for me to be lazy when you're being lazy because this stuff has to get done. So your laziness is really frustrating me. Right, the righteous are angry with sin, but to be angry with sin is not automatically righteous. The disciples here are angry because the sons of thunder, James and John, beat them to the punch. But Jesus will again seek to teach these disciples again. The Lord is abundantly patient with them, as he is with us, the true nature of his kingdom. Jesus knows where the disciples are getting their ideas about kingship. That's why he mentions the Gentiles again, right? You know how the Gentiles rule, they lord their authority over their subjects. So he brings up these Gentile rulers, and again, I think Herod and the, Her the Herodians and the Pharisees fall into the same category, right? Everything we've seen from the Pharisees, we see from the scribes even later in Mark, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? They love greetings in the marketplaces, the, the, high, the, high seat, the, the lofty places to sit, right? They love, they love those things. They want to be in the, in the, the seat of the, the nobleman, recognized as such, right? They're lording their authority over others. And this is exactly what Christ's kingdom is not. That's Jesus' point in verse 42. Jesus came in his earthly ministry not to exercise his lordship in a domineering fashion, but instead to lead through service, he says in verse 43. Now, this idea is something we already fleshed out in the first two accounts in which Jesus gave these instructions to the disciples. But what's added in this third account is noteworthy. Jesus says he came, the Lord in human flesh, to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. To minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is tied to the cup, which Jesus said he would need to drink. Tied to the baptism with which he would need to be baptized. Jesus is making clear to us the ultimate point of all his service. Right? It wasn't service simply to show. Jesus, of course, is a great example to us. It wasn't service simply to show a good example of what service looks like. But all this service was meant to culminate in him giving his life as a ransom for many. All of Jesus' fulfilling of the law, all the suffering he has already endured up to this point, right? all of Jesus' suffering matters for us. All the suffering he's endured and all that lay before him on his way to Jerusalem was for the purpose of ransoming a people for his own possession. Jesus would give his life, but that life would be given as a ransom. This is a clear parallel, again, I believe, to Isaiah 53. I'll read verses 10 through 12 again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. His soul an offering for sin. It's talking about a sin offering. He shall see his seed. <clears throat> he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many we shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Transgressors. A sin offering is being talked about again in verse 10 of Isaiah's servant song. It's an offering, right? What's this sin offering? It's an offering on behalf of a guilty person, in order to pay their debt through a substitute. And this is very closely tied with the idea of a ransom. Jesus was going to bear the iniquities of others, that is of other sinful men, 
in order that those sinful men would be justified. That's what we see in verse 11 of Isaiah 53. In verse 12, we see Jesus would bear the sins of many, pouring out his soul unto death. And in doing so, he would establish himself as their intercessor and mediator. For Jesus to be a ransom implies multiple things. It implies that we owe a debt. And it also necessitates that Jesus pay that debt in full in order to obtain our release. Otherwise, the word ransom means nothing here. That's what a ransom is. Right? It's paying a debt to secure, whether it's a prisoner, you know, somebody indebted to somebody else, it's securing their release. But if the ransom's been paid, then the, the release is, is sure. It's been secured. It's not, it's not uh, purchasing a potentiality of a release. It is purchasing a release. That's what a ransom is. Now, some may envision that this debt is owed to the devil. That's been said by many. Since we've been taken, right, the Bible says we've been <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible says we've been taken captive by the devil to do his will, right? So if we're captive by the devil, then maybe this ransom is being paid to the devil to secure our release. But we must understand that the debt we owe is not to Satan. We do not owe a debt to Satan. Jesus owes no debt to Satan. We owe a debt to God, right? It's God we've sinned against. It's God's just wrath, which must be satisfied if we're ever to have fellowship with him. Right? Our sins against him must be paid for and we must be given righteousness. Therefore, when Jesus speaks of himself as a ransom, we must understand that he is speaking about paying our debt of sin, which we owe to the Holy Father. This is a debt owed to God whose justice will not be violated by some false or flimsy version of mercy. Right? You can't call something mercy when justice is completely shirked uh, to establish it. That's just injustice. God's not unjust, he's merciful, and so he satisfies his justice by pouring out the wrath due our heads on his only son. And this is what God has done. Instead of this flimsy mercy, he has given us his great mercy, he's given us, uh, in his great love, his only son. And Jesus, the son who took on flesh, true God and true man, joyfully, joyfully took on the role of the one who would accomplish this work of redemption. And so Jesus' righteous life paid the ransom due for every elect sinner so that they might not perish but have eternal life. And we must understand further that Jesus, again, is clearly not saying he purchased the option of ransom for sinners. He gave his life as a ransom for many, and ransoms are never purchasing an option but, but securing the freedom of the one enslaved. And so Jesus' life was the ransom payment, meaning that his death, in his death, he successfully purchased the ransom of all his people. Right? If his life is the ransom, that means that there is nothing left to be paid because he gave his life as this ransom. And if there's nothing left to be paid, then those who have had their ransom paid are free. Christ has purchased salvation and all of it for his people in his suffering, in his substitutionary death on the cross, and in his glorious resurrection. Christ went about the work of purchasing for himself a people. That's what he was doing as he took on flesh. Going about the work of purchasing for himself a people to display the riches of his kindness and his grace. And because he was perfectly successful in this work, Christ's people are possessed by him. Right? The Son is seated in heaven. His work of redemption finished. And the Father is in the process of of joyfully bestowing on Christ his glorious inheritance. Right? Christ agreed to take on this role joyfully, willingly, uh, to be the one who would redeem a people for himself. The Father promised Christ a great reward in, uh, upon success of this mission. And so the Father's in the process of bestowing these gifts on Christ, as it says in Psalm 2, verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So the only way Christ is not going to have that is if he forgets to ask the Father. He's not going to forget to ask the Father. That was the purpose of this whole thing. Right? Christ asked the Father. The Father joyfully bestows the gift of his people on his Son. Things would get far darker, we'll see, for the disciples before they understood this glorious picture. But that was because Jesus was still making his walk to Jerusalem, still in the process of swallowing up death and darkness in victory. Earthly ascendancy was on the minds of the disciples, but Christ, loving them in the midst of their ignorance, in the midst of their arrogance, was on his way to giving them 
the king they truly needed. Right? Not this earthly king. That's not going to do anything for them. They have sins which need to be paid for. So Jesus knew what the suffering servant needed to do, and his face was set to that work. He was set to that work because he also knew that Isaiah said in the same suffering servant song, as we've read multiple times, that he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Right, Suffering was on the horizon for him, but he knew one day would come where he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Jesus believed that he would have life on the other side of death and that the Father would be true to their covenant, right, the covenant between the Father and the Son, to bless him with his purchased possession. So in conclusion, there are two main applications I think we should have from this account. The first is that you all as Christians are Christ's purchased possession. You belong to Christ not because you made the right choice all on your own. Right? Same option is presented to you and someone else, some unbeliever. All the grace of God, but you were wise enough to make that choice. No, God has been gracious. He has called you. He has saved you. He sent his son to be your ransom. You are called to love and serve a God. Right? And we've looked at, throughout Mark, right? it's, it's radical service that we're called to. Right? If your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If right? your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. You're called to serve, love and serve a God who bled and died for you. And who purchased for you forgiveness and eternal life. So let the songs and the praises abound in everything you do. Be a grateful people. We have to be a grateful people, recognizing what God has done for us in Christ. Be a people that marvel at the glories of such a reality and who work hard from a place of rest and security in Christ. Secondly, I think it's vitally important that we model Christ in his awe-inspiring, fearful, amazing way in which he went about his mission. Disposition matters. How we do things matters. Right, your attitude matters and it will communicate much to those who see your life. Right, you'll be checking the right boxes of obedience, but how are you going about that? Is it a joyful work for you? Our text is an example of what Paul describes of Jesus in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Right? How is he making this march to Jerusalem in the way he is? There's a joy set before him. He knows what the cross is going to be, but he also knows the joy on the other side of the cross. And so for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There's good work for all of us to do, right? God's prepared good works for us to walk in, but our disposition in these endeavors matters. What are we communicating about the grace of God to us and the joy it is to walk in those good works he's set before us? Your attitude, how you approach your work, how or whether you set yourself to God's appointed plans for your life matters. The glories of the gospel shine not in a cold-hearted declaration of the facts of the cross, the facts of the gospel, but in a joyful declaration from hearts transformed by that gospel. The glory of Christ shines in homes that labor together in joy, glorying in the grace of God, firmly trusting that walking after Christ by faith will be glorious now and forever. Again, Jesus went about his work for the joy set before him. We must do the same. Simple. We must do the same. If you men are going to lead well in your homes, if you're going to train yourselves properly for one day leading a household well, you have to go about your duties with a stable, purposeful drive. A stable, purposeful drive. That's what we see from Christ in our text. You can't be wishy-washy. You can't be going back and forth all the time, doubting God's purposes, His promises, spending time indulging in this or that lust, wasting your days away in vanity. You must be a man on a mission. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard for other people to follow you anywhere worth going. You women must be an example to your children and to one another of seeing, delighting in, and walking in God's purposes for your life. If you are begrudging your duties, then your daughter, daughters will learn to do the same. They and your sons will have to find a picture of a godly woman outside of their own home. And that would be a tragedy. 
And so, lay aside your sins. Run with patience. Run without doubt as to where history is headed and what your place is in it because you know your Bibles. Even when you're scared and not seeing everything with perfect clarity, what do we do? We walk after Christ. We follow Him. This is a most joyful work. For you've been bought with the blood of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great grace to us in Christ. Uh, we know that we would not do better uh, than the disciples in such scenarios, though we often scoff at them. Um, we thank you for the patience you display to them and the reminder it is of how patient you are with us as we continue to uh, fail in our duties, fall short of your glory. We thank you that it rests not in us, but in um, the ransom which Christ has paid um, for our souls. We thank you for such grace so far from what we deserve to have forgiveness, eternal life with you. Uh, and so we pray that our lives would be a testimony to your grace, uh, that you'd help us to call your law a delight and by your spirit to walk in it uh, with great joy, with great boldness, to declare the truth of your gospel from hearts transformed by that gospel. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.